Live from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2016. Brought to you by Mirantis. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Lisa Martin. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for the OpenStack SV or OpenStack Silicon Valley, hashtag OSSV16. I'm John Furrier, SiliconANGLE Media. This is theCUBE, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm joined with my co-host, Lisa Martin, next two days, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Our next guest is Lisa K. Woods, Director of Ecosystem Development for the Open Daylight Project. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much for having me. So the Linux Foundation's got all these different events. Um, SDN, Open Daylight, really not a lot of hype. It's all down and dirty right now. Reality is there, the rubber's hitting the road. Absolutely. Some, some say it's boring, boring it means it's good, <laughs> right? I mean, this is kind of what... You know, it's not boring though. I mean, you know, I, so I formally joined the Linux Foundation about a month ago. And I've been, you know, doing the rounds with the community, um, with our members, with um, people on the user side, and yeah. just understanding what they're working on and what yeah. they're doing. Um, and um, there's some neat stuff yeah. coming up. Um, one of the things that I was most excited about, um, and I, I had been talking about this for, for several years, was you know, SDN is a tool. It's not a goal, it's a tool. Um, it's how you get to bigger, larger goals. Um, and um, one of the, the calls, the early calls I had with one of our, um, our Silver members who is a sort of systems integrator, yeah. um, they said that exact same thing to me, and they said, you know, Open Daylight is at the core of one of our solutions, yeah. um, but it, that's, that's not what we're selling people. What we're selling people is IoT solutions. Yeah. We're working on smart city initiatives, we're working on, um, you know, things for energy companies, things like this, um, and you know, that was just music to my ears. You know, I'm tongue in cheek when I say boring. In fact, when we first started doing theCUBE in 2010, it was EMC World, at least so you could appreciate this. I met Dave Vellante and I called storage, snorage. That's what they used to call it, it was very boring. <laughs> but it wasn't boring because boring was the beginning, now we're on a wave of massive storage innovation. But I want to bring that back because this kind of tongue in cheek, open daylight doesn't get the fanfare mm -hmm. as a project vis-a-vis -vis other projects because of you know, the things are always shifting in the market. But the early adopters have had success there and I want you to take a minute to talk about what that means because Again, it is reality that some good things are happening. Yeah. Real proof points from early adopters. Could you share, uh, take a minute to share that, that aspect of what that means and what it is? Yeah, so um, there's been sort of a fairly predictable wave of adoption. Um, the first, the, the really earlier adopters tended to be telcos um, for a variety of reasons. And, um, you know, the real reason for people to go to the trouble of adopting SDN very early in its maturation cycle um, is if it's really, if the network is really critical to their business. Yeah. For carriers, it obviously is. Um, and they are under tremendous um, competitive pressures in terms of um, you know, web 2.0 companies coming in from one side, you know, new business models um, coming in from, from cloud providers and so forth. And so they really have needed to get you know, agile quickly and SDN has been um, something that they have very readily embraced. Um, the telco market in particular has really been um, very excited about um, open source. And they've been, um, AT&T has, you know, never loses an opportunity to tell people that they are going the open source route. Yeah. Um, they can do that because they have to have a lot of de developers on staff. What's been really interesting, yeah. um, especially with the upcoming release for Open Daylight, is that um, many of the projects um, within the next, up the upcoming release were actually proposed by, um, by user organizations, mostly telcos. Um, they were working on, um, they were working with Open Daylight um, in test, in some cases moving things into production, and started to see new opportunities for um, features that they needed, tooling that they were interested in having, um, that they were they wanted to build, not just necessarily so within themselves. So catalyst some new new opportunities. Catalyst to new opportunities. Some in some yeah. cases they, they built it you know sort of within themselves and kept that for themselves because it was competitive advantage. Other things like um, you know you can you can find this on the the wiki. AT and T has proposed the um, Yang sort of developer kit. Um, and they're sharing it with the community so that everybody can you know, sort of take their own Yang models and, and build from there. 
Um, so there's this whole ecosystem that's starting to, to emerge um, based on all of that early work and early innovation within the user community. Speaking of user communities, Open Daylight, you've got a community with 27 different user groups, 2,500 members, 600 strong developer community. Talk to us a little bit more, extrapolate or expand on collaboration. That was one of the themes of the keynote this morning was one of the keys to being successful um, for, uh, for users of Open Cloud is collaboration. Talk to us a little bit more about this sort of um, feedback loop that you just mentioned with AT&T going to be featured at your event at the end of September. Talk to us about how, how that feedback loop happens and how quickly that information is, is taken in in terms of agility to be utilized and shared to enable other, even non-telcos, to be successful. Yeah. Um, so, um, one of the things that Open Daylight did early on, which I thought was really important, was they set up a, a, a user advisory group. Um, and that was important because early on, a lot of the users were sort of in, in wait and consume mode. Um, you know, they were waiting for the developers to actually put stuff together that they could use. They weren't necessarily getting directly involved in getting their hands dirty themselves, but they wanted to have input. Um, and because it's an open source project, there was a, you know, an obvious opportunity to do that. Um, so you know, we, we bring the, the advisory group together, we put them together with the, with the project leads within the community, um, and it's just a very, very open um, session. All the sessions are open to the public. Um, and so you know, anybody can go and, and look at the, the minutes, look at the, the, the call. Um, and so there's, there, that feedback loop is not just within the, those, those particular group of individuals, it's not stuff that's happening behind closed doors, but it's out in the community, it's out in the open, it's out in public, and that can help spur further ideas at, you know, in, the, in the router world at large. Absolutely, kind of going along another theme of this morning's keynote, which was innovation. Can you talk to us about um, service providers and enterprises yeah. using Open Daylight to solve key network challenges that are related to automated service delivery, network resource optimization. What are some of the, uh, what's some of the impact that, that Open Daylight is having in that community? Um, so on the telco side, again, it, it, it um, has been a lot about you know, speeding up service delivery, um, saving on WAN costs has been a, has been a, a big motivator for a lot of people. Um, inter, inter data center connect, you know, DCI. Um, so, you know, tying together a lot of their operations in a more, in a logically decentral, or practically decentralized, but logically centralized manner, um, so that they can manage their, oper their whole operation but in a much more flexible way. So I want to ask you about open cloud and open SDN, because this is where SDN has kind of been a very geeky in the trenches kind of, technology, also the success cases of NFV, we've seen telcos with the pressure not only for over the top business model, but real scale on, on the innovation side have kind of come down to the plumbing, yes. which is SDN lives. But I want you to, uh, to share with us your view of the value as you collect the proof points, as you guys go to the next level with open daylight, what is the value of an open SDN vis-a-vis -vis closed SDN or other, uh, yeah. or is there a closed SDN or can you, can you just, parse that out for us and help us understand that. Yeah, so um, I would look at it from a couple of different lenses. One is um, acquisition model, um, and that, that's sort of the obverse of um, the different approaches to SDN in the market. Um, there is, shall we call it hardware-defined SDN? Um, that is, <laughs> that is SDN. locked, S <laughs> well, I mean, so there's, there's SDN that is, that is packaged within yeah. sheet metal, right? Yep. And you have to buy a big switch. Um, in order to get the software capabilities. Um, so that's one model. Um, the other is purely software, um, but proprietary software. Um, and it, you know, it's been packaged with you know, other so a whole software stack that goes along with that. Yeah. That runs on certain hardware. <laughs> I may remember when it runs on certain hardware. Um, you know, opens, open source in general, and, and Open Daylight in particular, because it was intended to be a general platform, a you know, general, general purpose, purpose platform, sort of cut, you know, splits the difference between those things. Um, it's because it's you know, purely software, it's something that you know, is completely platform agnostic. Um, open Daylight was um, intended to be um, multi-vendor, it was intended to solve the interoperability problems with uh, multi-vendor networks. Um, and so it's, you know, the there's, there's value just at that level. Um, but then on top of that, it's um, do I have to rebuild my entire network architecture um, because I need, to, I need now to go buy this new sheet metal? No, I don't. Do I need to buy this entire software stack um, and you know, re-architect my entire management stack? 
no, I don't. I can buy piece parts. I can buy, you know, a solution from a particular provider that solves a particular need. It happens to have open daylight in the core, but I don't need, you need to care about that. Or if I want to, if I really want to get into the nitty gritty because I have a specific need or a specific feature that I want to have and I don't happen to have a vendor who's willing to do that for me, I can go do it for myself. We were, we were talking about uh, collaboration earlier, but also John and I were talking about use cases. We just had Walmart Labs on. At the summit that's coming up, the ODL summit, in just about what six or so weeks at the end of September, are you going to have use cases, proof points, um, that align to what you just talked about? You can do this, you can do that. It's not a this only, that only. Talk to us about some of the use cases that attendees can expect to hear and see at the summit coming up. Yeah, so we have, um, I want to say, six or so uh, keynote speakers, mostly from user organizations, who are going to be um, sharing more of what they do. Um, you know, AT&T started um, with one project, and they've now sort of moved on to multiple different projects. Um, one of the things that I think was actually really interesting is, you know, they started with their sort of their own internal plumbing, and um, they have now moved towards um, using it as the basis of service offerings to their end user customers. Um, so really you know, driving, using it as a monetization engine as opposed to just something that, that is you know, a purely operational type of thing. Um, the other thing that, as I say, has been really exciting to me is to start seeing the, um, the, the, the channel ecosystem build out around open daylight. Um, you know, I have always said that SDN is a tremendous opportunity for the channel, um, who are especially those who have been really squeezed with hardware margins and things like this, because it's an entirely new revenue stream. Right, what is the value for the channel with SDN? Mm -hmm. It is, it's an, as I say, it's an entirely new revenue stream. It's, you know, with, when you're talking about open source software, the opportunity is um, taking piece parts and building, you know, either customized solutions or um, specific solutions around specific um, use cases for specific verticals. Um, you know, one of, one of the, the little app developers I was working with really early on had focused on the K through 12 market. And they realized that every, you know, every school district is completely strapped for cash. They have almost no IT staff because that's not what they're in the business of doing. Um, and they had no way of managing the on-site network stuff um, from a central office and SDN was the obvious solution for that. Um, and so they worked on, you know, from, from a, an operational perspective, but they also developed an app that gave, put, put the power of, of um, the network in the hands of teachers. So teachers could um, drop connections for certain students who are engaged in online learning. They could um, monitor the, act, the online activities of various students and, and map that to outcomes. Um, they could, um, you know, have a report that said, you know, Johnny was goofing off and going to these sites when he were, he was supposed to be doing these other things. And so when you're when when Johnny's parents come in saying, why are you giving my child a C? He's an A student. <laughs> There's the report. That apparently was a really really popular feature. Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, th th truly the possibilities here are almost endless, and we're really kind of just starting to yeah. scratch the surface. And I love that you're talking about SDN and a human connection. I think that's one of the most exciting things about technology from any sector. Yeah. Talk about the ecosystem as we wrap up here. What do you guys see happening? Uh, give us a, um, uh, uh, a prediction or insight into what you guys see happening, what you expect to happen, what you hope to happen. Yeah. Obviously there's reality, there's some real value. Yeah. Telcos are seeing the value with NFE, I think China, mm -hmm. Telecom and Comcast are big advocates yes. as well. of it, bridging yeah. that OpenStack. NFE, yep. IOT around the corner. I mean, is there other things I'm back? IOT imagine? definitely is 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 coming up. You know, I me I mentioned my my uh, my SI my SI friends who are who are you know that's kind of what they're building their business around at this point. Um, you know, as I say, telcos were early adopters, yeah. but we're starting to see that more and more in in larger enterprise, um, in transportation, yeah. in financials. Um, you know, K through 12 was was you know I, you know I, I mentioned that one particular app, but I I you know when I before I joined the Linux Foundation, yeah, that was probably a third of the people I talked to um, about SDN was K through 12 school districts. Um, you know, totally unexpected, but right. but there was a very a very clear and specific need there. Um, so you know, I think that we will start seeing more and more yeah. verticals. Um, join the fray, and fortunately, the ecosystem is is already starting to build. It's interesting itself too. Like we, you know, when you, I've seen these shifts in my my career, 
the cream rises to the top and it's not so much the hype, it's the, val it's the reality of the value. And we were talking uh, prior in our intro before Walmart came on, you know, Jet.com wasn't even around three years ago. Yeah. Okay, sold for $3 billion, but they had a unique value proposition that was different that catapulted them down into the digital, digital uh, business model that was worth billions. So I always get asked, like, where can I make money? Mm -hmm. As a developer, is always asking. It yeah. was the action. And so Open Daylight, I actually, one of the conversations I said was, in the plumbing of like the SDN world, there are unique tech opportunities to apply some of the game-changing enablers down there that could create new opportunities. Do you guys see that happening too as well? I mean, you mentioned these use cases are, are kind of seem orthogonal, you know, education to finance, I mean, telcos. Is that something that you guys see happening? Is that something that's being talked about in your community that there's real innovation opportunities? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, as they say, you know, it, what that looks like and what that means is different in different verticals, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, so obviously K through 12 school districts are not in the business of making money, um, but they are, they have, they have different, you know, metrics and requirements and results that they are required to, yeah. to provide. Um, and so, you know, it's measured differently, it's not measured in money, but, you know, the opportunity for innovation is there even so. On the, on the, you know, on the telco side, it's, or it's, it's much more yeah. about how do I deliver services quickly, how do I monetize those services quickly. In the enterprise, it's somewhere yeah. in between, it may or may not be, you mm -hmm. know, central to the business, but at, you know, at a minimum, it's about saving operational cost um, and improving, you know, service to the business. Well, that's, I mean, this is the benefit of open software. Yeah. An entrepreneur could come in, get their hands dirty, work up something, magic happens, or enterprise could use it to shift their business model. Yeah. I mean, this seems to be the common pattern that we're seeing on the Cube. Yeah, and, and, and I will stress again, for the channel, it's an amazing new opportunity. Yeah. An amazing new opportunity that they have and not channel, had. channel, you mean SIs and, and yeah. value-added resellers and, and things of that and nature. And so forth. I mean, yeah. it's, it's an opportunity they haven't had in years. Because in the they can customize. Market. Because they can customize, they can build services around it, they can yeah. build you know, custom solutions around it, um, consulting and that goes along well, with that's it. That's consistent with SAP, we saw our SAP Sapphire, sorry to interrupt, but the SIs are all kind of finding their own unique swim lanes. Yeah. EY is doing their thing, Accenture, PwC, but they're not actually competing. They got, they're picking a differentiation yeah. and building core IP around it. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a breadth of use cases that you mentioned that can facilitate that yeah. collaboration. It was, it's kind of like what um, Jonathan talked about this morning. It's the versus now becoming the and that we're seeing this yeah. trend, and I think yeah. that you've Lisa, thanks for coming that. on theCUBE, really appreciate Thank it. You Give for me the final me. word for the folks watching who aren't here. What's it all about this year in Silicon Valley compared to the summit and other events here last year? What's the big story this year? Here in the Valley? Here at OpenStack SV. Oh, here at OpenStack SV. Um, you know, open I mean, open source is real and it's providing value and there are monetization opportunities all across the ecosystem for it. And it's healthy. It is healthy. It's healthy? It's okay. very healthy. Okay, Lisa, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. I'm John Furrier, Lisa Martin here in Mountain View in Silicon Valley. You're watching theCUBE, be right back after this short break. Thank you.